Hi, I'm Uncompetitive, and this video is called Uncompetitive Loves Forza Motorsport 7 Ultimate Edition. For this review in perspective, I will need to first talk about my history with the franchise. I have enjoyed every title in the series since I started playing it with Forza Motorsport 3. I bought my day one Xbox One for the singular purpose of playing Forza Motorsport 5 and no other game, as none of the other launch titles appealed to me. This sequel was lacking in cars and tracks, but Turn 10 has remedied the latter deficiency by releasing additional tracks to the community for free, funded in part by people like myself who had invested heavily in microtransactions in order to collect all of the cars they wanted to compare and contrast, upgrade and tune, and snap silly nine cap liveries on. It was fun, and well worth the additional £180 that I put into the game. The necessity to purchase bundles of intermediate virtual currency required me to carefully calculate exactly what I wanted in order to avoid being left with car tokens that I couldn't do anything with, and which would require an additional purchase of bundled virtual currency to not waste. I then was able to buy all of the cars that I wanted in that game's only weekend sale, where everything was half price. These were exceptional circumstances and I haven't bought a microtransaction since. If the Xbox One had launched with any other games that interested me, then I would have spread my money around. But the way I rationalised it was to see it as no different than spending money on rolling stock for a model railway to enhance my primary hobby. Former fans of these series reacted badly to the introduction of car tokens in the series, so its developer turned tech it would only put them into the sequel if the community asked them. As a result of this policy, Forza Motorsport 6 got very positive view, with many sites highlighting that it had zero microtransactions. Many, including myself, took this as a green light to pre-order the title, and I naively assumed, without confirmation, that I would find all the cars that I had purchased in Forza Motorsport 5 in my garage because it only seemed reasonable to me that they would do this to enhance customer goodwill as they had already made the car model and there were many other new cars in the sequel that I would be more likely to buy if they didn't expect me to be purchased old favourites. This was not the case. Not only that, they reversed their policy and miraculously incorporated the shop into their game only a month after its release. There was no way that they had to listen to the post-launch fan feedback, taken a management decision to work on a microtransaction system, got their team of programmers to develop, test and deploy this with the game in such a short time interval. That is just not humanly possible. I suspect that they had it working for launch, got cold feet over a potential fan backlash to a more aggressive microtransaction system to introduce a price spinner and loot box, decided to hold back that portion of the code for a secretly planned post-launch update. They expected me to pay four times for the same car, once to obtain it in Port Supply, then once to obtain it and unlock it for use in that game, paying to skip the grind of having to accumulate race wins for the cars that weren't fun to buy, then pay again to obtain it in Forza 6 and paid to unlock it again. I wasn't prepared to do that, and as a result I turned my back on the game in disgust and played Drive Club instead, to join the transparency of a system that would only sell you the individual cars for the real money who had attained sufficient in-game faith. Through this mechanism, Drive Club avoided pay to skip, pay to win, and my has no intermediate virtual currency involved. I very much approve of this model of monetization, which is also seen in Titanfall 2, and feel it needs to a term to distinguish it from microtransactions, which have become maligned for good reason. I would propose they are called micro DLC. Technically, this content should be made available after give the studio's team of artists 
something to do between projects and to avoid fail. As with its predecessor, Force the Most Force 7 also has loot boxes which can contain mods. However, these are now the only way to gain more in-game winning for more challenging raids. It used to be that it would give you more credit for turning off individual assists such as having simulation style steering or disabling the ability to rewind each time you made a mistake. This is now gone. The players who want to be rewarded in that way are coerced to gambling. At present you can only buy loot boxes with in-game credit. But with refreshing candor and transparency, Tarantan clarified up front that this would not remain the case long term, saying that once we confirm the game economy is balanced and fun for our players out in the wild, we plan to offer token as a matter of player choice. Some players appreciate token as a way of maintaining immediate access to content that may take many hours to acquire in the normal course of play. There will also be options within the in-game menu to turn off tokens entirely. However, all of these pay to win, pay to skip and pay to earn mechanisms are irrelevant to me as I am uncompetitive and they are very easily ignored. Were I not happy to race against the AI mimics of absolute players, or a path taken by a rival who can't fishtail me the track at the first corner because I only appear in the game in the form of a goat, then I would have a serious problem with this game as I am against microtransactions being incorporated into all games, including those so-called free-to-play ones prevalent on smartphones. I can well appreciate that someone else would not feel the same way and would be dismayed at the encroaching tide of greed that has come to swamp this formerly prestigious franchise. It is a shame that Forza has to carry all of this spiny baggage in order to offset the cost of licensing its hypercar. This is me racing, racing around the Nordschein in my open top Alfa Romeo sports car. It is extremely challenging and I will be getting very wet right now for the game. I'm having a lot of fun. I'm playing this on the original Xbox One on my 42 inch plasma with an Xbox Elite controller and I'm quite impressed with how it looks and feels. I've yet to set up a wheel that I purchased but I will probably upload further footage once my Xbox One X Project Scorpio edition arrives in a little over a month's time. I plan on purchasing an external hard drive for the purpose of recording extended gameplay. I quite enjoy making all of these little reviews of the games that I play. And currently, it is only my PS4 Pro that will allow me to stream directly to YouTube and give my relaxed, off the cuff reaction to the aesthetic, mechanics, and dynamics of the game, whilst leaving the story to be critiqued by others, unless its theme has been conveyed with how it looks, feels, and plays. Indeed, I'm far more likely to analyse the control scheme of the game and how it could have been improved than the screenwriting or its main antagonist, which is usually only of C movie quality. This is more the same. Recycling tracks and cars from the previous Forza game. The dynamic weather isn't as good as the drive club, but having been in races that started in the dark until dawn broke over the track in later laps. It has the edge on Sony's title with some extraordinarily pretty sky. I also feel that night racing benefits enormously from a tighter feedback loop, all out of it being double the frame rate of Sony's otherwise superior game. 